"'Ah, Colonel,' said Holmes, arranging his rumpled collar, "'journeys end in lovers' meetings, as the old play says. I don't think I've had the pleasure of seeing you since you favoured me with all those attentions as I lay on the ledge above the Reichenbach Fall.' The Colonel still stared at my friend like a man in a trance. "'You cunning, cunning fiend!' was all that he could say. "'I have not introduced you yet,' said Holmes. "'This gentleman is Colonel Sebastian Moran, once of Her Majesty's Indian Army, and the best heavy-game shot that our Eastern Empire has ever produced. I believe I am correct, Colonel, in saying that your bag of tigers still remains unrivaled.' The fierce old man said nothing, but still glared at my companion. With his savage eyes and bristling moustache he was wonderfully like a tiger himself. "'I wonder that my very simple stratagem could deceive so old a shikari,' said Holmes. "'It must be very familiar to you. Have you not tethered a young kid under a tree, lain above it with your rifle, and waited for the bait to bring up your tiger? This empty house is my tree, and you are my tiger. You have possibly had other guns in reserve, in case there should be several tigers, or in the unlikely supposition of your own aim failing you. These,' he pointed out, "'are my other guns.' The parallel is exact. Colonel Moran sprang forward with a snarl of rage, but the constables dragged him back. The fury upon his face was terrible to look at. "'I confess that you had one small surprise for me,' said Holmes. "'I did not anticipate that you would yourself make use of this empty house and this convenient front window. I had imagined you as operating from the street, where my friend Lestrade and his merry men were awaiting you. With that exception, all has gone as I expected. Colonel Moran turned to the official detective. "'You may or may not have just cause for arresting me,' said he, "'but at least there can be no reason why I should submit to the jives of this person. If I am in the hands of the law, let things be done in a legal way.' "'Well, that's reasonable enough,' said Lestrade. "'Nothing further you have to say, Mr. Holmes, before we go?' Holmes had picked up the powerful air-gun from the floor, and was examining its mechanism. "'An admirable and unique weapon,' said he, "'noiseless and of tremendous power. I knew von Herder, the blind German mechanic, who constructed it to the order of the late Professor Moriarty. For years I have been aware of its existence, though I have never before had the opportunity of handling it. I commend it very specially to your attention, Lestrade, and also the bullets which fit it. "'You can trust us to look after that, Mr. Holmes,' said Lestrade, as the whole party moved towards the door. "'Anything further to say?' "'Only to ask what charge you intend to prefer?' "'What charge, sir? Why, of course, the attempted murder of Mr. Sherlock Holmes.' "'Not so, Lestrade. I do not propose to appear in the matter at all. To you and to you only belongs the credit of the remarkable arrest which you have effected.' "'Yes, Lestrade, I congratulate you. With your usual happy mixture of cunning and audacity, you have got him.' "'Got him? Got whom, Mr. Holmes?' "'The man that the whole force has been seeking in vain. Colonel Sebastian Moran, who shot the Honourable Ronald Adair with an expanding bullet from an air-gun through the open window of the second-floor front of No. 427 Park Lane, upon the 30th of last month.' That's the charge, Lestrade, and now, Watson, if you can endure the draught from a broken window, I think that half an hour in my study over a cigar may afford you some profitable amusement. Our old chambers had been left unchanged through the supervision of Mycroft Holmes and the immediate care of Mrs. Hudson. As I entered I saw, it is true, an unwanted tidiness, but the old landmarks were all in their place. There were the chemical corner and the acid-stained deal-top table. There upon a shelf was the row of formidable scrapbooks and books of reference which many of our fellow citizens would have been so glad to burn. The diagrams, the violin case, and the pipe rack, even the Persian slipper which contained the tobacco, all met my eyes as I glanced round me. There were two occupants of the room, one Mrs. Hudson, who beamed upon us both as we entered, the other the strange dummy which had played so important a part in the evening's adventures. It was a wax-coloured model of my friend, so admirably done that it was a perfect facsimile. It stood on a small pedestal table with an old dressing-gown of Holmes's so draped round it that the illusion from the street was absolutely perfect. "'I hope you observed all precautions, Mrs. Hudson,' said Holmes. "'I went to it on my knees, sir, just as you told me.' "'Excellent. You carried the thing out very well.' 
Did you observe where the bullet went? Yes, sir, I'm afraid it has spoilt your beautiful bust, for it passed right through the head and flattened itself on the wall. I picked it up from the carpet. Here it is. Holmes held it out to me. A soft revolver bullet, as you perceive, Watson. There's genius in that, for who would expect to find such a thing fired from an air-gun? All right, Mrs. Hudson, I am much obliged for your assistance. And now, Watson, let me see you in your old seat once more, for there are several points which I should like to discuss with you. He had thrown off the seedy frock-coat, and now he was the Holmes of old in the mouse-colored dressing-gown which he took from his effigy. The old shikari's nerves have not lost their steadiness, nor his eyes their keenness, said he with a laugh, as he inspected the shattered forehead of his bust. Plumb in the middle of the back of the head, and smack through the brain. He was the best shot in India, and I expect that there are few better in London. Have you heard the name? No, I have not. Well, well, such is fame. But then, if I remember right, you had not heard the name of Professor James Moriarty, who had one of the great brains of the century. Just give me down my index of biographies from the shelf. He turned over the pages lazily, leaning back in his chair and blowing great clouds from his cigar. "'My collection of M's is a fine one,' said he. "'Moriarty himself is enough to make any letter illustrious, and here is Morgan the Poisoner, and Meridu of abominable memory, and Matthews, who knocked out my left canine in the waiting-room at Charing Cross, and finally here is our friend of to-night.' He handed over the book, and I read. Moran, Sebastian, Colonel, unemployed, formerly first Bangalore pioneers, born London, 1840, son of Sir Augustus Moran, C.B., once British minister to Persia, educated Eton and Oxford, served in Jawaki campaign, Afghan campaign, Cherasiab, dispatches, Sherper and Kabul, author of Heavy Game of the Western Himalayas, 1881, Three Months in the Jungle, 1884. Address, Conduit Street. Clubs, the Anglo-Indian, the Tankerville, the Bagatelle Card Club. On the margin was written, in Holmes's precise hand, the second most dangerous man in London. This is astonishing, said I, as I handed back the volume. The man's career is that of an honorable soldier. It is true, Holmes answered. Up to a certain point he did well. He was always a man of iron nerve, and the story is still told in India how he crawled down a drain after a wounded man-eating tiger. There are some trees, Watson, which grow to a certain height, and then suddenly develop some unsightly eccentricity. You will see it often in humans. I have a theory that the individual represents in his development the whole procession of his ancestors, and that such a sudden turn to good or evil stands for some strong influence which came into the line of his pedigree. The person becomes, as it were, the epitome of the history of his own family. It is surely rather fanciful. Well, I don't insist upon it. Whatever the cause, Colonel Moran began hot to hold him. He retired, came to London, and again acquired an evil name. It was at this time that he was sought out by Professor Moriarty, to whom for a time he was chief of the staff. Moriarty supplied him liberally with money, and used him only in one or two very high-class jobs, which no ordinary criminal could have undertaken. You may have some recollection of the death of Mrs. Stewart of Lauder in 1887. Not? Well, I am sure Moran was at the bottom of it, but nothing could be proved. So cleverly was the colonel concealed that, even when the Moriarty gang was broken up, we could not incriminate him. You remember at that date, when I called upon you in your rooms, how I put up the shutters for fear of air-guns? No doubt you thought me fanciful. I knew exactly what I was doing, for I knew of the existence of this remarkable gun, and I also knew that one of the best shots in the world would be behind it. When we were in Switzerland he followed us with Moriarty, and it was undoubtedly he who gave me that evil five minutes on the Reichenbach ledge. You may think that I read the papers with some attention during my sojourn in France, on the outlook for any chance of laying him by the heels. So long as he was free in London, my life would not really have been worth living. Night and day the shadow would have been over me, and sooner or later his chance must have come. What could I do? I could not shoot him at sight, or I should myself be in the dock. There was no use appealing to a magistrate. 
they cannot interfere on the strength of what would appear to them to be a wild suspicion. So I could do nothing. But I watched the criminal news, knowing that sooner or later I should get him. Then came the death of this Ronald Adair. My chance had come at last. Knowing what I did, was it not certain that Colonel Moran had done it? He had played cards with the lad, he had followed him home from the club, he had shot him through the open window. There was not a doubt of it. The bullets alone are enough to put his head in a noose. I came over at once. I was seen by the sentinel, who would, I knew, direct the colonel's attention to my presence. He could not fail to connect my sudden return with his crime, and to be terribly alarmed. I was sure that he would make an attempt to get me out of the way at once, and would bring round his murderous weapon for that purpose. I left him an excellent mark in the window, and, having warned the police that they might be needed, by the way, Watson, you spotted their presence in that doorway with unerring accuracy. I took up what seemed to me to be a judicious post for observation, never dreaming that he would choose the same spot for his attack. Now, my dear Watson, does anything remain for me to explain? Yes, said I. You have not made it clear what was Colonel Moran's motive in murdering the Honorable Ronald Adair. Ah, my dear Watson, there we come into those realms of conjecture where the most logical mind may be at fault. Each may form his own hypothesis upon the present evidence, and yours is as likely to be correct as mine. You have formed one, then? I think that it is not difficult to explain the facts. It came out in evidence that Colonel Moran and young Adair had between them won a considerable amount of money. Now, Moran undoubtedly played foul. Of that I have long been aware. I believe that on the day of the murder Adair had discovered that Moran was cheating. Very likely he had spoken to him privately, and had threatened to expose him unless he voluntarily resigned his membership of the club, and promised not to play cards again. It is unlikely that a youngster like Adair would at once make a hideous scandal by exposing a well-known man so much older than himself. Probably he acted as I suggest. The exclusion from his clubs would mean ruin to Moran, who lived by his ill-gotten card gains. He therefore murdered Adair, who at the time was endeavoring to work out how much money he should himself return, since he could not profit by his partner's foul play. He locked the door lest the ladies should surprise him and insist upon knowing what he was doing with these names and coins. Will it pass? I have no doubt that you have hit upon the truth. It will be verified or disproved at the trial. Meanwhile, come what may, Colonel Moran will trouble us no more. The famous air-gun of von Herder will embellish the Scotland Yard Museum, and once again Mr. Sherlock Holmes is free to devote his life to examining those interesting little problems which the complex life of London so plentifully presents. End of the Adventure of the Empty House, Part 2